Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's Caffeine for the Soul. And today I want to explore goals and contentment. And in order to do that, I want to share a little bit of my story. I was a very goal-driven young adult. I did lots of seminars that told me that goals were the secret to success, that there was a study in 1957 at Yale University that showed that the 3% of the class with written goals outperformed over a 20-year period the rest of the entire graduating 1957 class from Yale who didn't have clearly written goals. Now, it turns out, just as a, a caveat, that study never happened. That study is bandied about in so much of the success literature but there's literally no evidence that it ever happened. Somebody made that up and it became a thing. But like I had read that and I was like, yeah, okay, I want to be in that 3%. I'm going to clearly write my goals. And, and I remember one of my first big goals when I was working as an actor was I wanted to work in, in 1994. I was going to work 365 days of the year as an actor and I did it. Now, I did it by saying yes to a couple of jobs that everything in me wanted to say no to, but my goal said yes. And, and it wound up being one of the most miserable years of my life. And I got very goal shy for a little while after that, but I read more of the success literature. I read more things telling me how important goals were and how goals were going to be the key to my success. So I set more goals and I worked harder and I, I set a goal of taking my business over the, the, the seven-figure mark, and I, I worked really hard, and I, I got a television pilot that was going to get my work out into the public, and I pushed myself so hard that I got physically ill to the point where I couldn't work at all. And I kind of went the other way. Like, it was sufficiently dramatic that I thought, all right, goals may be the answer to something, but they're not working for me. And so I kind of decided I was better off not dreaming. I was better off not having goals, not having desires. I found lots of Buddhist texts that supported me in that, lots of spiritual texts that said, ah, yes, desire is the root of all suffering. Oh, great, so I'm just not going to have desires. And I genuinely became contented. I became contented to the point where I was being interviewed for a magazine and they asked me what my five-year plan was and I thought about it and I said, well, I'm really happy and I love my life. So five years from now, I want to be really happy and love my life and I meant it and it was beautiful. But at a certain point, I realized that that unwillingness to feel desire was shrinking my world. As one of my coaches said to me once, you're living a masterpiece of a life on a postage stamp of possibility. And so I really wrestled with this because I was so afraid of going back to being that goal-driven, at-all-costs person. And I didn't really know how to allow myself to want things without killing the contentment that had become so precious to me, that had become such a, a part of how I lived my life. And, and I, I had a, a teacher, a professor of comparative Buddhism, and I, I asked him about it. Because it seemed to me, well, desire can't be the root of all suffering if it's natural. Because it seems to me that there's a certain kind of simple desire not I want in order to, not I want because it makes me look cool, not I want to make myself happy, but just that'd be cool. Wouldn't it be cool if, oh my goodness, can you imagine? that? I couldn't imagine how that desire could be the root of all suffering. And he said, well, that translation, desire is the root of all suffering, even though it's the most popular one, isn't the most accurate one. He said, a more accurate translation is misunderstood desire is the root of all suffering or craving is the root of all suffering. And I really heard something in that because I got it. 
When that simple desire, wouldn't it be cool, became, and then if I have that, I'll have this, and then if I have that, I'll have this, and if I don't have that, I'm going to lose all this, right? When desire turns into craving, when our sense of well-being and contentment gets wrapped up in desire, it contaminates it. It turns it from a simple, natural expression of the expansive nature of spirit, of life itself. And it becomes this dark thing that brings out all our fear and insecurity and greed. And so I open myself back up to dreaming. Now, I kind of consider myself an amateur at contented dreaming. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of new to it. It's still very fragile to me. I still find myself going almost without noticing from contented dreaming, from contented desire, to that old kind of craving and must-have. But because I've experienced it now, because I have a real sense of what it is to simply want something for the pleasure of it, not with any need attached, not with any need for it to happen, for me to continue to be content, I found that there's something really beautiful in that sweet spot between contentment and desire. And as I was reflecting on that recently, I remembered one of the first conversations I had with a, with a very successful client. And at the time, he was the most successful client I, I worked with. I wrote about it in my book, You Can Have What You Want. And I asked him as we were sitting by the sea, looking out this amazing view that he had at his home. I, I said, how do you do goals? And he said to me, well, once or twice a year, I'll sit here, I'll go out to a, one of our favorite restaurants, I'll sometimes do it on my own, I'll sometimes do it with my wife, and we'll dream. And we'll just think about all the things that might be fun to have or create in the year ahead. And there's usually a few of them that I kind of go, yeah, yeah, I'd like to make my life, at least part of my life about that this year. And he said, and then, you know, the next time I sit down, I, I probably won't look at it again for about six months, and I'll see if I still am in love with it, am I still excited about it? Does it still light me up? And if I am, I'll keep going. But if it started to feel like work, I'll, I'll either change it or get rid of it. If it's starting to feel, oh God, this has become a burden, I'll just let it go. And if a new goal comes along, if a new dream comes along, I'll just switch over to that. And I I actually heard in my head, I wanted to stop him and interrupt him and say, no, 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 goals don't work that way. But as I was looking around his, his home and his estate, I was thinking, well, what if he's right and I'm wrong? And then he went on to say something that, that really impacted me. He said, as far as I'm concerned, the only real purpose in having a goal is if it makes you fall more deeply in love with life. And now, from this kind of place of contented dreaming that I find myself in more of the time, that really makes sense to me. What if goals were neither good or bad, but they were a way of allowing yourself to dream, to expand possibility, to expand in possibility from a place of complete contentment. What if the purpose of a goal was to help you fall more deeply in love with life? Have fun, learn heaps, and I'll talk with you soon. <laughs>